My name's Dawn Foster. I'm a columnist at The Guardian. I write for a lot of places and do a lot of TV and broadcasts, mostly around social inequalities. And the biggest one facing us at the moment, I think, is housing. Um, I'm delighted to introduce, in, introduce Josh Ryan Collins, whose book was uh, out a month ago called Why Can't You Afford a Home? Um, we'll be discussing that today, a lot of the issues around finance and the social problems with uh, housing in the UK, both in terms of renting, buying, and what and the, the problems that housing causes for the wider uh, community. Um, so the format here, uh, we'll basically start with Josh giving us a 45 minute talk on his book. He'll talk about why he wrote it, what, um, what the problems are that run through the core of the book. Uh, then we'll have a short discussion and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, so Josh is the head of research here at UCL in the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Um, it's a new academic department that was opened in October 2018. This is his third book. His previous two books were called Where Does Money Come From? and Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing. Um, and Josh's main areas of research are finance, housing, the economics of innovation, climate change, and central banks. Um, so I'll hand over to Josh now, and he'll talk you through what he's done. Thanks very much, Dawn, and thanks, everyone, for coming along today. Um, I'd also like to thank IIPP's uh, events team, in particular Victoria and Emily, for their help putting this event together. I'll just say a few words initially about the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, because we are uh, shiny and new. Um, we were launched uh, just over a year ago today. Uh, director, uh, founder and director is, is Mariana Mazzucato. Um, we're a new department within UCL, situated in the Bartlett Faculty for Built Environment, one of the uh, most prestigious um, faculties in the world on uh, space design and sustainability, and of course on housing and planning and land, which will be the topic of today's uh, lecture. Um, our mission is to change how public value is imagined uh, created and evaluated to tackle societal challenges and achieve inclusive and sustainable economic growth. What do I mean by public value? Well, I mean something other than market value. Um, so what we're interested in is essentially uh, thinking about how public policy can create something that is beyond just that which is created in the markets via exchange, via the, the price system. It's a different role for the state and the public sector uh, than is envisaged in mainstream economics, because in mainstream economics, the primary role of government is essentially to fix and lubricate the market, fix market failures um, with the assumption that the market can do most stuff pretty efficiently uh, by itself. Uh, we would challenge that view, and we would argue that actually uh, what the state should be doing, what the public sector should do, is actually create and shape markets to support uh, public purpose and public value. And nowhere, perhaps, is this more relevant than the, the two topics of, of, my, uh, of my book, Why Can't You Afford a Home, that I'm going to discuss today. Um, because, actually, finance and land, the, the, the topics I'll be discussing, uh, are uh, certainly not subject to the standard rules of supply and demand that mainstream economic, mainstream uh, free market oriented economics talks about. So it's a, it's a relevant topic for, uh, for our institute. Uh, but let's go back to housing. Um, this chart shows the house price to income ratio uh, in 17 advanced economies uh, since 19. 81. Um, it's, it's an average across those economies. So this is a, a good measure of affordability, essentially, because it's showing the relationship between house prices and average incomes. Now, what's interesting about this chart is that you can see from 1980 up to around 2000, there's, there is some cyclicality, house prices moving up and down, but that ratio appears to be following some kind of equilibrium. It's, it's coming back. To, uh, to some kind of equilibrium. Um, uh, and I've indexed this chart to the long-term average across all of those economies um, at 100 there. 
But something strange happens in the late 1990s. Um, of course, the lead up to the financial crisis saw very rapid increases in, in house prices. Um, but what's most interesting, perhaps, is that fall uh, post-crisis in the ratio, homes becoming more affordable. Um, but that fall doesn't bring us back to that uh, previous period, that, that, that sort of equilibrium uh, ratio level. And my talk is really about trying to explain what happened, what has happened in that latter period. The result of this really significant step change in affordability since the late 1990s has actually been a decline in the levels of home ownership in uh, Anglo-Saxon economies in particular. Um, and this perhaps is, is a, I guess, the most remarkable finding that I uh, discovered when doing the research for this book, is that um, it's, this is not just a UK phenomenon. In all the classic Anglo-Saxon economies, uh, you've seen this decline in home ownership uh, since around um, 2000. So it sort of peaks around 70% uh, in 2000, a bit earlier in, in New Zealand. Um, but since, since the sort of mid-2000s, that, that level has been falling quite significantly. Um, so in the UK now, we're down to um, 60, 60, 63, uh, 64%, and similar, similar figures in other uh, countries. Um, so, you know, this concept of the home-owning democracy uh, that is so key to uh, free market capitalism, uh, it doesn't seem to be working. And, of course, this is just averages. Um, we know that in big cities in the major Anglo-Saxon economies, London, Manchester, Sydney, Melbourne, Auckland, Vancouver, Toronto, Los Angeles, median house prices uh, have risen to over seven times median incomes, seven times. And now the standard measure of affordability is three times median incomes, right? So, I mean, this is a serious, serious problem because, because of course, that's where all the jobs are in our modern economies. And, of course, the hardest hit by this process have been younger adults, the millennials. Um, just to give you some examples, in the UK in 1996, two-thirds of 25 to 35-year-olds on middle incomes owned a home. By 2016, this was just a quarter. In the US in 2004, almost 45% of the same age group were homeowners, a figure that dropped to 35% by 2016. And in Australia, home ownership among the under 40s declined from 36% in 2001 to 25% in 2015. So the foundational promise of liberal capitalist economies is that if you work hard enough, uh, you, can, you can have a home of your own, a stake in society, it no longer holds true, certainly if you're in that younger age group. So uh, what, can we, what can we do uh, about this? I mean, just to, just to be clear, um, that fall in home ownership is unusual in the sense that it hasn't happened before, basically, from 1900 right up to uh, the 1980s, no, right up to the 2000s, you had, you had increases in home ownership. The, the models seem to, be, seem to be working. So how do we explain the housing affordability, housing affordability crisis? Well, there's a lot of different explanations out there. Um, uh, Build more homes, not enough homes, uh, too restrictive planning, um, population going too fast. Uh, from both the right and the left, there, there, are, many, there are many suggestions. Um, a topical favorite today, um, you'll be delighted to hear, that the man who's leading the most important diplomatic <laughs> negotiations in this country's history in probably the last 40 years, believes the reasons that we have high house prices is uh, immigrants. Immigrants are, the, are, the, are culpable. It's Dominic Rab. Um, so, so that's good. Um, basically, uh, I, as, you, as you might be able to gather, <laughs> I don't buy uh, that any of these, these explanations uh, are enough to explain the pattern that I showed you in this, in this chart. Um, and I'll tell you why. Um, because in the night, what we see here is this very clear shift in the, in the late in the early 2000s, late 1990s. And I don't believe any of those explanations, increases in population, 
planning restrictions can, can explain that because it's not, it's not the case that in all of those advanced economies, the planning regulations suddenly became much more restrictive in the late 1990s. Nor is it a case that populations in all of those countries <coughs> suddenly increased in, in that period. Um, and, and actually, it's also the case that we didn't just stop building more houses in that period. Something else, uh, something else is going on here. There is an elephant in the room. Um, and unfortunately, it's not a sort of sad, relatively harmless looking elephant like this one. It's quite a vicious elephant, uh, and it's one that's, that's quite out of control, and uh, it's called the financial sector. Um, so I just kind of threw that slide in. I quite like it. But anyways, there's an elephant in the room. Um, <clears throat> and I think if we're going to, uh, to understand uh, the nature of this elephant, before we get to kind of what finance is, we do actually have to have an appreciation of... Uh, what causes, you know, the, what are the fundamental drivers behind house prices? And, and actually, a fundamental driver is land. Um, uh, some research, a recent, a really good recent paper by Catherine Knoll and, and, and co authors studied 14 advanced economies um, since 1950, found that 81% of the increase in house prices uh, can be explained by rising land prices with the remainder attributable to increases in construction costs and labor costs, the standard costs associated with building a home. So we're really talking about increases in land values driving house prices. Um, so what, 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 from an economics perspective, what, what, is, what is land? What do we know about land? Well, um, what, when we say land in an economics context, we really mean location. Okay. Um, People don't want to live anywhere. They want to live in specific, desirable locations. They want to live near where they work. They want to live near a good school. They want to live near a nice park. Okay? That, you, know, you can't just put them anywhere. So although there's a lot of space, or, or, you know, unoccupied space, the green, the green belt, et cetera, actually people want to live um, in specific places. So location, 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 as the estate agents say. Um, and, and what this means is that there is an inherent limit to the supply of land where people and housing where people actually want to live. Um, you can build roads you can, and you can put down rail, rail lines to uh, reduce the distance between where people live and where they work. But ultimately, there's a limit. People do want to live in a finite uh, space. There is, so land is inherently scarce and inelastic. And in that sense, it's not like most other commodities. The main form of, of land in capitalist economies is landed private property, um, although there's multiple forms of, of ownership, of course. You can have leasehold, you can have freehold. There's, there's different models. The, the key point I want to make here is that land and housing itself has multiple economic uses. It, uh, land and property is a consumption good, provides housing services, shelter, um, but it's also a financial asset. It can be used to store wealth over time. And thirdly, and most importantly for the talk today, I think, land, for, for the reasons I've just explained, um, is a really important source of collateral security for borrowing, again, from the bank. A bank will always favor uh, lending in return for collateral because it means if the loan goes bad, it has something it can take. So these, these multiple economic uses and how they play out determines, uh, is a, plays a really important role in in house prices. Now, what this all means, of course, is um, those of the, the, if you're lucky enough to own some land or, or, or property in an area where the economy is growing, where there's investment, where there's, there's growth, where the government is building roads or uh, improving the productivity of, of the land, or where there's nice cafes opening up or a good school, if you happen to live in that area, uh, you will see the value of the land underneath your house appreciating over time due to no effort uh, of your own, essentially. Um, now, this is rent. This is termed in, in, in economics uh, rent. And it was the absolute central pillar uh, of the founding fathers of economics, central concern of the founding fathers of economics, David Ricardo, Adam Smith, and John Stuart Mill, these austere gentlemen here. Their great concern 
uh, with the development of capitalist economies was that landowners would swallow up an increasing share of the growth via rent extraction, putting up rents over time, uh, and that that would lead to a, a sort of repression of wages and a repression of capitalist profits, which enables investment, improving productivity and innovation and the like. So they put it at the heart of their, of their critique of capitalist uh, development and argued it should be taxed. The government should essentially tax those, those land rents, that increase in the value of, of property and land over time. And Marx also viewed rents as a huge problem, and people that followed Marx did. Um, but their solution was different. They, they argued for the socialization, the nationalization of land, and thus socialization of, of land rents. But all of the, the, the founding fathers of economics agreed on this as a fundamental problem. Um, but then, towards the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, we had the emergence of neoclassical economic theory and neoclassical growth theory. And this chap, John Bates Clark, uh, was perhaps the most important figure uh, of that time. Now, the, the classicals argued for a, a labor theory of value, ultimately la a, a value derives from, from labor, uh, and the capitalist, essentially, by mixing together labor and capital, goods, etc., and commodities, um, creates profits. Um, and they, they had three categories of income, wages, uh, attributed to labor, uh, profits for the capitalist, and the third category of rent, which went to the landowner. Bates Clark had a different view, and uh, the neoclassical theorists argue that actually value derives from the subjective preferences expressed in the process of free market exchange, buying and selling stuff, essentially. If something can be sold on the market, it has value, and the value equates to the price that it's, it's sold for. Um, and private property rights were not really challenged, they were, because they were seen as fundamentally important for free market exchange. So whereas Mill and, and, uh, and Marx uh, challenged the distribution of land and argued that this could lead to these inequalities, this was not a, an issue for, for John Bates Clark and, and the neoclassicals that followed. Um, they argued that actually in the long run, all factors of production had the same marginal productivity uh, and, and there was no need essentially to really think about rent as a serious issue. In marginal productivity theory, income is simply one's reward for one's contribution to production. Um, and wealth is the savings uh, that are uh, uh, due to one's productive investment effort, i.e., there is a very clear relationship between how skilled you are, how hard you work, and your, your income. You, you get what you put in, essentially. It's all very fair. Um, and there is no account of rent uh, in, this, in this account. So you can see his famous book, The Distribution of Wealth, Theory of Wages, Interest in Profits, no mention uh, of economic rents. And unfortunately, this uh, theory was adopted by mainstream economic theory. Um, and we ended up uh, where we are uh, today with the gradual erosion of the tax base um, over time. Um, uh, and this just shows from it, this graph from the book showing the decline in property tax in the US because it, it wasn't seen as, as important to tax rents. Um, uh, and also because obviously people wanted to own their, more homes and they didn't want to be taxed on the, the increasing value, the rent that they were able to extract uh, from their homes. So that's land, and that's uh, the sort of uh, position we, end up, we ended up in um, with, with not much taxation of those rents. What about finance? Well, let's turn to banks. What do banks do? Again, mainstream economic theory, to put it slightly crudely, because we've only got 45 minutes, uh, views banks basically as intermediaries. They take money from savers, uh, and they invest it in entrepreneurs. Um, so they take money from one part of the economy, put it out somewhere else that's more productive, increasing the efficiency of, of allocation. Essentially, this is a flawed theory. Um, actually, uh, and I'm obviously not the first person to say this, because Joseph Schumpeter and, and Keynes uh, and others before them recognized it, but actually that's not the primary role of banks in the modern economy. The primary role of banks is to create uh, new purchasing power via their lending activity. 
Um, uh, so when a bank makes a loan, it expands this, its balance sheet. It grows its balance sheet. It creates an asset, which is the loan. It creates a liability, which is a deposit in your account. And that is money. You can use that to pay your taxes and buy anything else. It's it, it par with central bank money. With, with, you can use it to withdraw sterling from a, from a cash machine. So, and so in that sense, the creation of, of money, the creation of, of uh, credit creation actually creates the deposit, creates the money, and creates the savings. So it's the other way around. Um, uh, uh, lending creates savings rather than savings enabling investment. Um, and Keynes, this, Keynes put this at the, the heart of his, of his theory. So um, the key question then is, you know, it's new purchasing power, it's new money, it's money creation. Where does it go into the economy? Um, now, classically, it supports businesses. It supports businesses. A business uses the money to either pay workers or invest in uh, capital, uh, new, product, new forms of production, innovation, etc. That, in turn, generates GDP transactions. And in, that, and in that way, the money that's been created can be spread through the economy. Um, and you don't have, hopefully, inflation. Um, but there's, of course, another thing that banks can do with their lending, their credit creation. Uh, they can put it into existing assets. And the, the asset they've put it into most substantively over the last 30, 40 years is housing. Uh, banks have used their credit creating power to buy existing houses, enabling us to buy existing property. This creates a different, a less productive, it's a productive cycle on the left, but there's this other cycle on the right. Um, and the, pr the prime uh, point I really want to make today is that if you put new money, new purchasing power, into an existing asset, a house, you will inevitably increase uh, the value of that property. Because that money is not supporting GDP transactions, it's not helping wages, it's not helping productivity, it's not making the economy more efficient. Of course, when you pay back a loan, you are doing the opposite of what the bank does. A bank creates money. Um, when you pay back a loan, you're destroying money. So it's not quite as simple as, as, as money just simply inflating house prices. But if you have a, a dynamic where more bank money uh, is being created than is being repaid, more loans going out than being repaid, you will inevitably have inflation uh, and house price inflation. So credit lent to land and property increases land prices, um, increases a debt burden in the economy, uh, uh, reduces demand because people are paying out more debt, uh, et cetera, and round, uh, and round we go. The result of that is this rather uh, stunning graph, um, which shows that, um, from, this is from 1870, it shows mortgage credit uh, as a percentage of GDP outstanding loans on the left-hand side the red line, and on the right-hand axis, it's real house prices. And what you can see is, from about 1870 up to the, the, um, the, the 1980s, um, the, the, the ratio doesn't change uh, a huge amount. Uh, the cre credit stock outstanding uh, is around about 30 or 40% of GDP, mortgage credit this is, and house prices similarly uh, are not moving uh, a, a huge amount. And then not, 1990s, uh, it all goes crazy, basically. You have this huge expansion in mortgage credit, uh, and you have this rapid increase in house prices. <clears throat> uh, you also have uh, a, a really important um, change in the amount of mortgage credit relative to non-mortgage credit, which is primarily supporting businesses, supporting investment, as I've discussed. And again, the sort of tipping point is in the late... 1990s. Again, this is averaged across 17 advanced economies. Um, this, is, this shows what happened in the UK. Uh, here, again, the, the red line is, is mortgage debt. Huge growth starts much earlier from the 1980s in the UK when Margaret Thatcher deregulates uh, the banking system, the Big Bang, etc. Um, whilst lending to firms, sort of, you know, it increases much, much more slowly as a percentage of GDP and house prices uh, uh, shooting up. Um, different pattern in the US. In the US, you can see uh, there hasn't been the same big increase in house prices um, from such an early period, but it starts shooting up in the, 
in the, 19, in the early 2000s as you have this securitization, uh, this expansion in, 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 in mortgage lending enabled by securitization. Um, and um, Australia is a bit closer to the UK, uh, where you've had um, uh, fast rises in mortgage credit from uh, the mid-1990s uh, onwards. So again, the point I'm trying to make is this is not just a problem for the UK. The same dynamics in all of these Anglo-Saxon economies which chose to deregulate uh, their financial sectors. Why did they do that? Well, they did it, the US, UK I'm talking about here, because um, of two things. Firstly, there was this very strong drive for home ownership. It was a vote winner. You know, give people a home, you can, you can, you can win their votes. Margaret Thatcher's uh, right to buy program was basically a way of getting voters away from, from labor, um, right to buy social, formerly social housing, privatization of social housing. Um, but in the 1970s, the, the programs of affordable housing and the purchase of land at, at affordable prices, the creation of garden cities, these big... Um, ambitious planning programs suddenly started to look very expensive because governments were racking up big budget deficits. Um, and then we had the inflationary shocks. Um, and basically, politicians said, well, this is a problem. We haven't got enough money to keep doing this, building these affordable homes, etc. Uh, we'll deregulate the banking sector and we'll let the banks lend to people uh, so that they can, they can still buy, buy homes. And that's what that's what's happened, essentially, in these, in these countries. Um, <clears throat> so we've ended up um, with what I call in the book this house price finance feedback cycle. Um, now, and, and I think this is, this is absolutely at the center of the challenges we're facing in capitalist economies. Um, and and more, than just, uh, more than just housing affordability, it creates, it creates much wiser problems. Of course, that's a big enough problem in itself. But essentially, the um, deregulation I talked about, coupled in the 1990s with these financial innovations, in particular the securitization of mortgage debt, where you package together lots of different loans and then you sell them um, off to an you know, institutional investor, a pension fund, enables banks to increase the supply of mortgage credit relative to people's incomes and relative to growth in the economy. Um, government simultaneously subsidizes mortgage lending. You have mortgage interest rate tax relief was very popular across almost all advanced economies from the 1990s onwards. Um, in, the, in this country, we've, we've got help to buy equity loans, etc. All of this increases mortgage debt relative to people's income, uh, increases land and house prices relative to incomes. At the same time, you have declining wages, stagnating wages. You have um, the sort of uh, re reduction in, 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 in the quality of, uh, and security of pensions um, and, uh, and social security more generally. So there's actually increasing demand for, for, for the home um, as a financial asset to, to support you when you're older, to pass on wealth to your children, and increasing speculative uh, demand, both domestic demand, this buy-to-let explosion in the UK, uh, and overseas demand. This, of course, um, pumps up house prices, even more demand for debt, and round and round we go. My argument in the book is basically all Anglo-Saxon, all the Anglo-Saxon economies are, to some extent or another, caught up in this, in this uh, cycle. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there's, this is, of course, theory, but there is empirical evidence uh, to back it up, which I talked through in the book, studies by uh, the OECD, by the IMF, uh, which look at um, about 18 advanced economies and do all kinds of very complicated econometrics, looking at all of the supply side, uh, typical arguments, population, elasticity of the land markets and planning rules. And they, they both find, both these big studies find that financial deregulation was the key cause of increase house prices. So there is, there is strong evidence to, to support this theory, uh, empirical evidence. Um, just talk briefly about Europe, because I think um, if you just ignore France there for a minute, France is kind of nothing hugely interesting to say. Similar process happened there uh, to an Anglo-Saxon, but sort of a bit, a bit calmer, not quite as extreme. But look at Ireland and Spain. And this just shows real house prices. And what's interesting about uh, Ireland and, 
and Spain is um, then um, at the height uh, of the affordability crisis, both Ireland and Spain were building uh, housing, building new homes, three times faster uh, than any other country in Europe. So in that period where you see house prices shooting up, they were building literally tens of thousands of new homes. But it didn't stop. It carried on. It carried on going, and you saw faster house price appreciation than in nearly all, relative to incomes, uh, than in nearly all other European countries. So, I mean, the, the lesson from that clearly is banks can always create new credit at a faster rate than you can build uh, more homes. Uh, bank credit is inherently elastic uh, relative to uh, building, building homes. Right, that's the bad news. Uh, it's quite bad. Um, what, about, uh, what about the good news? Uh, well, the good news is it doesn't have to be this way. Um, there are examples from uh, uh, a couple of important and successful economies around the world where uh, we haven't seen this inexorable increase in house prices relative to income. So this is the... Uh, chart I, I talked about at the beginning again, but uh, focused. Um, I've got the Anglo-Saxon average, which is the, the purple dotted dotted line there, um, as you see, going up. Um, but then we've got Germany, Japan, and Korea, uh, where actually house prices have fallen relative to incomes uh, since the mid-1990s. They're sort of going up a bit in Germany now, I'm sad to say. Bit of a housing bubble in Berlin. But... Um, Clearly, the, the, the broader trajectory is, is housing's actually become more affordable in these countries. So, so why, why, uh, why is this? Um, I think it's really important to, to think about. Um, so I'm going to just talk about uh, a few different areas where I would propose and that I propose in the book we should think about uh, reforming things. Um, finance and uh, focusing on finance first and then on land policy. Um, on finance, um, I think there's a really strong case for basically looking at the institutional structure uh, of modern banks. Um, so in the UK, we have an oligopolistic banking sector. It's dominated by five big banks. Uh, you probably all know who they are. Um, and they have a very similar business model, actually. Their business model, um, their shareholder-owned banks, they need to make uh, double-digit returns on equity, every quarter to their shareholders. You know, that, and that's quite tough, actually. Um, and so what they do is they make, quite, they make loans that are as big as possible um, and as low risk as possible. Now, guess what? The, fa the best kind of loan <laughs> is big, lasts a long time, creates lots of interest, and is low risk. You've got it. It's mortgages. Um, and that's what they like doing. They're big. They like making big, big loans. Um, but there is a different kind of bank. Um, and Germany is blessed uh, with having this different kind of bank or banks. Uh, they have, um, I think it's around 200 uh, or so cooperative banks and another couple of hundred uh, public, local public banks, the Sparkas. And, and these banks have a very different business model. Um, uh, and I've just tried to outline these two different models here. The shareholder bank model on the left uh, and what I've called stakeholder banks on the right. Shareholders... I've explained, owned by their shareholders. Stakeholder banks actually owned by members, local or regional uh, state members. They're, they have much more of a public purpose um, focus uh, than the shareholder banks. Uh, they're interested in supporting the local economy, and that's often part of their constitution. They don't demand those double-digit returns on investment. And um, they have a different approach to risk. So whereas the shareholder bank always looking for collateral to de-risk their loan, property being the favorite type. The stakeholder bank reduces the information asymmetry uh, with the borrower by building a relationship with them over time, by getting to know their business, um, getting to know the, the business owner, getting to know the local economy. It takes work, right? High transaction costs, not of interest to the larger shareholder bank. Um, and they do lend to SMEs. They lend to SMEs without always demanding their house in return for their, for their loans. So I think we need to think about how we create that sort of stakeholder banking model in the UK. Uh, and one proposal that I worked on when I was at 
the New Economics Foundation, was to actually break up the Royal Bank of Scotland, which we own anyway, uh, into um, regional or local banks, uh, more focused on business lending. The other main proposal I would make on the institutional reform of the banking system would be to embrace uh, the idea of state-directed finance. Um, now, there's an interesting uh, case that actually the uh, building of railways and waterways, canals across France and other parts of Europe in the, uh, in the 18th century was actually supported by a very large state, state investment bank, uh, the Crédit Mobilier. Um, and I just think that the, the name is very interesting, Crédit Mobilier. Uh, it funds m mobility, it funds transport, infrastructure. It doesn't, f uh, the opposite is, immo in French, is immobilier, uh, real estate. Okay, that's what it, what it means. Um, so essentially, we're, we're stuck at the moment in this country and, and other Anglo-Saxon countries with uh, crédit immobilier. Um, we just fund stuff that sits there and doesn't go anywhere. We need to, we need to move towards crédit immobilier. Um, so something to learn from the, from the French there. Of course, the modern-day equivalent, the leading example is the, the KFW in Germany, um, which is a very large state investment bank, around 20% of its assets make up around 20% of GDP. It support massive support for green energy innovation that we've, we've written about at IIPP. Um, and uh, it also subsidizes the Sparkassen uh, local banks uh, that I was talking about earlier for, say, green loans for home insulation or putting up solar panels. On the roof. So the ecosystem in Germany is completely different, the banking ecosystem, from that that we have here. Um, the other main area, I think, is, is monetary policy and central banks. So central banks, um, ha rather than pushing back against that housing finance feedback cycle um, in the post-crisis period, I mean, to some extent they have pushed back. There's this new policy agenda called macroprudential policy, where banks have to hold a bit more capital against mortgage loans than they, than they used to. But quantitative easing, this enormous money creation um, process, the buying of government bonds, the lowest risk bonds in the market via the creation of new central bank money, has actually made land and real estate a much more attractive financial asset for investors and for households, um, because essentially you're pushing down the interest rate you receive on government bonds and other low-risk um, assets, because they've also bought corporate bonds, uh, and you're making land much more attractive. And, and I think that's a key explanation for that um, uh, return in that house price uh, to income ratio um, uh, from about 2013 onwards. QE has fed into appreciating asset prices. There's, some, there's other stuff banks can do, uh, central banks. They can embrace, uh, do what they used to do, and do credit guidance. So in that post-war period I was talking about, um, central banks would actually guide credit towards the sectors of the economy they were seen as most important, typically manufacturing, exports, uh, other strategic areas, industry. And they would actually repress credit flows going into real estate and also consumer credit, because they saw those as inherently risky areas of the economy, prone to bubbles, prone to speculative um, bubbles. They stopped doing that in, uh, in the 1990s, essentially, that credit guidance was, was abandoned because it was felt that the market knew best and all that was necessary for central banks to do was get find the natural rate of interest uh, where the market would, would clear. So I think central banks need to move away from being so focused on interest rates and price stability and think more about credit allocation and credit, credit quantities in the economy. What about taxation? Now, for me, you know, it's absolutely central that we start taxing these uh, rents from land, uh, land value uh, appreciation. Um, now, the most popular proposal, um, and one of those rare proposals that's uh, loved by both economists on the left and the right, um, is a land value tax. Uh, this would be a tax on the incremental increase in the value of land um, from, you know, from January to December uh, in a particular year. You tax that away 
uh, that, because that is the product of collective investment uh, by the wider community. Um, and I think this would be important in breaking this housing finance um, cycle, feedback cycle, because at the moment, essentially what banks are doing is they're leveraging um, their loan against that increase in value that happens over time. They're leveraging it against the rent. And actually, they're capitalizing that rent via the charging of interest on these bigger and bigger mortgage loans. Okay? Now, um, that's, that's really important because there is an argument to say that the more people own homes, the spread of home ownership also involves the democratization of those rents over time. Because the more people own homes, the more everyone has a sort of a share in the increase in value um, in the economy. But the more um, mortgage debt makes up, the higher the mortgage debt makes up the proportion of the increase in value of your house, um, the less of that rent goes to you and the more goes to the bank, basically. Um, and as we've seen bigger and bigger loans um, relative to equity, which we have seen, uh, essentially banks are capitalizing more and more of that rent. So a land tax would eat into that. It would basically eat into that uh, process. It would mean banks couldn't make, uh, house prices would fall, banks couldn't make such big loans. And I think it would, if, if introduced gradually uh, and offset with other kinds of uh, tax reductions, potentially, you know, get rid of council tax, highly regressive tax, um, maybe even reduce income tax, uh, start taxing um, windfall profits and unearned incomes and not, not work. Uh, 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 that, would, that would be a very sensible way forward. Finally, I think I'm just going to talk a little bit about <coughs> ownership um, and tenure. So um, we're obsessed with private home ownership in this country and other Anglo-Saxon economies. Um, but actually, um, in some of those other countries I, I mentioned, um, it's, not, it's not quite that simple. So let's just take one example, Singapore. Singapore is held up as this bastion of free market uh, economic liberalism, very low tax rates uh, if you're a business or if you're a, a household. Um, but actually, in Singapore, the state owns 90% of the land. Um, land is essentially socialized. Um, and what they do is they lease uh, land to the private sector and to households for you know, limited periods of time, and they basically tell them, you know, you're doing this with that land, you're building affordable housing, you're building, you're putting industry here. The whole thing is much more planned. They are shaping the land market. Um, and a similar story in South Korea, where you have this very large land, Korean land corporation that controls 50% of all residential and commercial development. They purchase, they develop, they sell the land, they capture the land, the increase in land value from the economic activity that they uh, enable. So, um, quite different models there. Um, I think large-scale land nationalization, nationalization is probably not realistic in this country, um, but uh, I think we, can, we, we need to at least accept, um, I'm trying to sort of summarize now, that, that this obsession uh, with, with home ownership and the home-owning democracy uh, now needs to be abandoned. You know, it's no longer working. We've seen falls in in house prices. And as a first step, we should become a 10-year neutral country. Um, this favor favoring home ownership by having no capital gains on your primary residence is a huge subsidy uh, for the rich, essentially. Um, and we need to remove that. Um, we need to make uh, renting a much more attractive proposition, provide much more secure uh, tenancies. Uh, in Germany, it's, it's very hard to be uh, thrown out of your property unless you essentially stop paying your rent or damage the, the property. The onus is on the landlord, essentially, to prove there's a problem. Um, and in Germany and, and Switzerland, uh, around 50% uh, um, enjoy uh, the generous provision of rental or social housing. They're two of the most productive economies in the world. I think, just to summarize, really, uh, our political leaders need to be brave enough to stand up to uh, vested interests that are holding back these, these kind of reforms. Um, they need to be taking steps now uh, to direct finance towards productive areas of the economy 
um, that will create demand from somewhere else, not from constantly increasing house prices and mortgage equity withdrawal from those, those houses. <laughs> a debt-led uh, growth model is no longer sustainable. Uh, and, and that would enable, I think, and fiscal policy has a key role to play here. You know, we need to abandon austerity and the government needs to become much more proactive in investment, in innovation, investment in infrastructure. And that will, should enable, I think, a gradual uh, reduction in house prices, a managed reduction of deflation um, that would enable us to shift to a more sustainable and inclusive economy. Thank you. Um, we'll just have a short conversation and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, I'll go through my copious notes. Um, I suppose one thing, touching on two things, um, how would you make the arguments to an individual? If you were having a conversation with a friend in the pub, for instance, how would you make the argument to them about land value tax? Well, I can't show all of these slides. No, here. exactly. <laughs> so if, if somebody here was having a conversation with somebody and yeah. you want to convince them that land value, uh, rather than you know, regressive council tax in our current system, mm. was the way forward, how would you talk to them about how it might affect them if they were yeah. a homeowner, say? Yeah, I think probably what I'd do is, um, if they had kids, will you let me yeah. let them have kids? Yeah. Um, I, would, uh, I would ask them about you know, how they think their kids are going to mm. buy a home um, when, they, when they grow up. Because I think, I think we're sort of reaching a tipping point where there's enough middle class homeowners who are really starting to worry about that and not wanting to have to you know, hand over to their kids or downsize mm. in order for their kids to be able to afford what what they have. Um, and I th so that would probably be the approach I would take. I mean, would, if we instituted kind of land value tax, would it, how would it affect current homeowners in the kind of immediate and short term? I think um, it, would, it would depend how it was, it was implemented. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, the risks, the problems with it are that if you are uh, asset rich but cash poor, you're a pensioner, you, you're sitting in a nice property but you don't have much income there's a challenge about how you pay it basically and that's and that's a potential barrier but there are ways around that problem i think you know one way around it is to delay the payment of the tax until the the person is able to downsize or they they pass away um, or or have some sort of equity release program where the state takes a share in their property um, uh, so i think there are there are ways around that sort of barrier of course the, the press tend to latch onto those mm. sort of things and are not very helpful. But we've got to start getting more creative in, in sort of pushing back on that. Um, and I was really interested what, what, uh, in, the, in the part about the sh uh, shareholder banks versus the stakeholder banks. Yeah. Can you talk a bit more about kind of where, you know, the kind of examples you've seen of shareholder banks and how they benefit the kind of local communities? Yeah, so um, the, the, the German model is probably the best known. But in Switzerland, you also have uh, called cantonal banks, which are sort of regional banks. Typically, these banks, the board is made up of, of, for example, somebody from the municipality, somebody from local businesses in the area, um, some, uh, somebody representing trade unions, maybe. Uh, so it's, it's a sort of mixed uh, board. Um, they don't have sharehold, you know, these shareholder demands. Um, and typically, you know, the bank owner knows the local businesses. And, you know, it can sound a little bit you know, nepotistic, incestuous. But um, on balance, I think it's a better, a better system. Or at the very least, we should have some of that mm. as well as our big shareholder banks. The problem at the moment is we've just got this very homogenous banking system where everyone's doing the same thing. And it benefits small businesses, you said. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... And can you talk a bit more about the kind of risk profiles that you were talking about with the lending with them? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the German sort of Mittelstand, these, mm. these um, medium-sized, small and medium-sized enterprises have been... You know, the, the, the Sparkasse and these smaller and cooperative banks have been absolutely key to the success of the, of the German uh, Mittelstand. Um, what are, what are, they don't only lend to businesses. Typically, they have a mixed portfolio. They will have some mortgage lending. They will have, you know, business, business loans and other kinds of, of, of loans. Um, and you need that to have a successful, you know, safe bank. But what, what we've, in this country, we've sort of gone too far the other way where we kind of only have loans to, to households and, and a very small, it's actually less than 10% if you look across all banks in this country, the, the assets that actually support business. 
Um, great. I mean, can you talk a bit more about what you mean by making us a tenure neutral country? Yeah, so I think at the moment, essentially, we favour home ownership over um, uh, both uh, public housing and um, renting um, because of the subsidies, basically. Uh, housing benefit obviously is a sort of sort of subsidy for for social housing, you could argue, but actually it tends to end up lining the pockets of landlords yeah. um, rather than uh, rather than really helping um, people uh, at the bottom end of the income spectrum. Um, so that, you know, via taxation and via these other subsidies that I talked about, help to buy and mortgage interest rate tax relief, uh, essentially it's all a big subsidy for for mm. private homes vis-à-vis -vis the other sectors. Mm. Um, and how much have you seen the, the shift in renting um, affect the way that the kind of British economy works, especially when you look at right to buy and how mm. a lot of renting has moved out of kind of local councils and to private landlords? What yeah. does that do to the way that you know, money, money circulates in the UK? Well, it's just a sort of inequality machine, mm. essentially. It's... Um, you know, it's it's we we've had this uh, increasing polar you know polarization of wealth um, with anyone who who owns a house seeing their wealth increasing in value um, that using the increase in value of their own house to buy a second home buy to let mortgage um, which further increases the rent that they can extract um, and you've seen rents going up uh, as well in certain areas of the country like London for example rents have really gone up quite quite fast. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and so you get that intergenerational gap, especially getting bigger and bigger. Mm. Um, and increasingly in London, that's becoming a serious political issue you know, for the first time because the, the number of renters has reached a, yeah. a level where they're really starting to take a stand, which is most welcome. I think. Um, do you think we're at a kind of crisis point now in terms of housing and electoral politics because we've essentially created a system where young renters can't get on the housing ladder, but any reform to housing means that people who do have those assets in, you know, there doesn't seem to be a way of addressing those inequalities without some of the people who already have the assets taking some kind of hit, which is obviously political kryptonite for anybody else. Yeah, I mean, that's, you, you've hit, it on the, hit the nail on the head there. That is the, the key challenge, really. I mean, I think, I think there's got to be an appreciation that the current system is just unsustainable. Mm. Uh, and as I say, I think we are reaching a, a, a tipping point. But I think we need some very clever political strategists to find the right language uh, to start introducing these these policies in a in a very gradual but fair way. So you know, if you're going to introduce a property tax, a LVT, for God's sake, introduce it at a very low level uh, and make it fiscally neutral yeah. and give give people you know a carrot as well by reducing other other taxes. Um, do you think right to buy has run its course? And how much of an effect do you think right to buy has had on our current housing crisis? Yeah, I, th I think there's, there's evidence that um, you know, the Conservative Party is, has sort of woken up finally to the fact that the, the policies of the last sort of 30 years you know, haven't worked. Um, you know, there is a fall in home ownership levels. I'm sure they've clocked on to, to that. You know, the Letwin review is looking at land value capture um, and, and realizing that it's just not fair for private developers to, to capture all of that increase in the value of land that's zoned for residential property, for example. Um, and th for the first time, there's evidence that they are actually developing, thinking about policies to help renters rather than just private homeowners. So, yeah, rays of light. I, mm. um, I suppose this is a crisis 35 years in the making, would you say? Yeah. Or, um, yeah. What do you think? What do you think the missed opportunities were that, that the last Labour government could have done that they didn't do and that may have fed into this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I think the, the, the Blair government had a huge uh, opportunity, uh, given that the majority had the mandate that they had to, um, for example, uh, introduce a serious property tax, re even revaluing council tax, you know, last revalued in 1991. Um, as, as I showed you in those graphs, all of the, the, the growth has been in the 1990s onwards. So it's madness not to revalue it. I think more disappointing almost in a way, though, is that they actually, that government, those, those, those administrations um, further supported the, the financialization process. They actually 
you know, their, mo their business model was, you know, let, let the city rip and we'll use the taxes from that to, you know, support poor people, basically, and, you know, improve, improve a bit of health spending, etc. Um, and that, that's fundamentally not a sustainable model, as hopefully I've tried to, to show. So, so that, in a sense, was the bigger disappointment. Mm. Um, and obviously, it's not just a problem in the UK, but globally. Um, I've recently started getting invited to Dublin a lot because Dublin are having a huge housing crisis yeah. now. And Dublin have, you know, compared to uh, local, local earnings, Dublin have the second most expensive housing after London. Um, they've obviously had a similar sort of issue, but I mean, what haven't uh, Ireland learnt? Um, and are they just replicating the UK system? Well, interestingly, Ireland did introduce a property mm. tax um, quite recently at a very low level. Um, so they have sort of taken a positive step um, in that direction. But they have, as you say, they are now ex seem to be experiencing another very fast house price appreciation. Um, I think what they've, they've probably learned the lesson not to, to build loads of houses, um, assuming that prices will carry on yeah. going up. So hopefully the, you know, the, the fall will be less painful for them in, in that sense. Um, but they, they, Ireland also has a, a problem with a lack of diversity in the banking sector, just a, a couple of, of big dominant banks. So mm -hmm. there, are, there are some concerning similarities with the UK, I'd say. Um, and just... On GDP, um, mm. if, if I recall correctly, you, you know, almost almost the entire growth in GDP since the crash has been in housing. Mm. Um, so, I mean, how reliant is the UK on housing for GDP, and is that a remotely sustainable model? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I've what I've tried to convey is is how sort of you know our whole wider macro economy has become tied up in rising in house in rising house prices um, are, are, that's what drives consumption basically um, and uh, you know it, it is unsustainable because and it's inefficient as well because um, if your if your economic model rewards those at the top of the income spectrum much more than those at the bottom you're going to get less spending basically because people at the bottom will always spend any extra pound you give them will get spent whereas at the top it will just get you know, put into buying another house or, or other kinds of less productive behaviour. So it's a huge misallocation of, yeah. of capital. Um, and my final question before we open it to the audience. What do you think about rent controls and the, argue, and the arguments for and against them? Yeah, I mean, I basically su support the idea um, of rent controls. Um, I think, you know, they, they should be limited to, uh, the, ideally, to the level of income in the local economy which um, you know I'm sure is not is, is, is more is harder in practice than you know in, in just saying it but I think that's what we should be aiming mm. to strive for and we should also be aiming to limit the level of new mortgage mm. uh, lending to the level of people's incomes otherwise we're just going to repeat this yeah. this process um, we'll open it up to the floor now I think we have a roving mic um, I'm going to take an equal number of questions from men and women um, so if no women put their hands up, we're just going to sit here. And can you keep them short as actual questions? If it sounds like you're going to give a lecture, I'll just demand the microphone to sell them back. Um, so can you... I've got contract lenses in, so I'm not brilliant, uh, brilliantly sighted. So we'll start with the, gut, with the person in yellow at the back. We'll take them in rounds of three. And... <laughs> Uh, thanks, Josh. Um, a question here. If um, the people who have received a whole bunch of appreciated value through these years, we're kind of in a situation now about how to justly undo that. Um, part of the reason why it might be difficult to undo that is that uh, those people, the middle class, who have had those homes who have appreciated, it's kind of in a context of wage, wage stagnation and this asset welfareism where uh, you need a home to retire with dignity. So with the state kind of retreating from that and having these deregulated labour markets, to what extent do you think we have to fix this by looking at other things in the economy, uh, or can you really take the houses off those people and expect things to kind of be okay? And not only from the electoral perspective, but kind of what's the fair thing to do here to undo this? Um, can I take, yep, and can I take the woman in green behind you? Do you think buy to let mortgages should be banned? Very good, short question. And one more. Um, yep, just the, the guy in black there, and then I'll move around the rest of the room. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just to follow on to the point about mortgage leverage um, that you were making, I guess 
if you were to reduce the amount of, um, which is a good idea um, if all things are equal, to reduce the amount that people can leverage their incomes. But if you have cash buyers, uh, particularly cash buyers who can raise uh, mortgages outside of the country and you don't have capital controls, then would that just mean uh, uh, homeowners here would suffer relative to cash buyers? Brilliant. Um, just to kind of briefly reiterate, reiterate um, we were asked about other things in the economy that might be able to help housing. Should buy-to-let mortgages be banned and the influence of cash buyers and capital controls? So there you go. Yeah, very good questions. Um, on the first one, um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, wage stagnation is a major, is a major problem. And, um, you know, house price appreciation has sort of kept things chugging over, essentially, as we face this. Um, so, you know, the reforms I've proposed need to be accompanied by um, uh, an increase in, in wages uh, via uh, fiscal expansion uh, by, um, by the, the government, by the, the Treasury. Um, austerity needs to be properly abandoned. Um, uh, we need to, um, I think, have a much higher minimum wage. Um, and, uh, you know, that will make the whole process of introducing, say, a, a property tax um, much smoother. I think. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, I basically agree with your, your point there. Um, buy to let mortgages, um, yeah, basically, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say no to banning them completely, <laughs> um, uh, I, but I do think what what you what you need to do is you know we still we still need rental properties and we still need uh, somebody to rent them out. Um, so um, we, we'd have to find um, another kind of landlord if if we don't want a, um, a sort of speculative buy to let sort of um, model. Um, and I think institutional investors, pension funds, insurance companies could play an important role here uh, because uh, rental income is a very uh, secure, if low, relatively low yield source of income. And that's exactly what pension companies and insurance companies are looking for because they've got long dated uh, liabilities. Uh, so I think you know, building um, high quality, uh, affordable housing for rent supported by institutional investment uh, could be a really could be a really good alternative to the sort of uh, speculative individual buy-to-let landlord. Um, the As the third question, um, what do you do about cash buyers? Yeah, I mean, this is a really good question. I mean, particularly in a place like London, you've had huge uh, foreign uh, investment, people literally buying up properties in nice parts of London as a pure financial asset, not even living there mm. in, many, in many cases. Um, I, I, I just think that needs to be, um, you know, that needs to be stopped. Uh, if it's not possible to, to create capital controls, um, which, by the way, I think are generally a good idea, but if, if it's not possible to do that, um, then you just need to, to, to ta really to ramp up the taxes on that kind of property investment to make it uh, just completely unattractive um, to foreigners. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, we'll move slowly down here. Uh, can I get three cameras? Close to the front. Yes. Um, can I get the gentleman in glasses just there? Just save you running all the way down the front. Hi. Do you have any thoughts on narrow bank? So Switzerland recently had a referendum on that. So sort of take away this power to create credit from banks and have them act as other financial intermediaries. Um, I've got two in the front here. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I. I, I Josh, the, the, the chart that you showed of the increasing house prices to income um, over time has mm. two interesting correlates, and I'd like to put two questions to you. Um, one is that it coincides, of course, with the maturity in the, in the upswing of the baby boom generation, and then its retirement. And the question I want to ask you there is about this distributional question. The title of your book um, why you can't afford a house is addressed to an audience like this, and I'm, I'm one like that who doesn't own a house. But of course, there is half the population that do, mm. and that upswing has been a tremendous boon to that part of the population yep. and a detriment to us. What does that tell us about the political economy of this situation? Why it ended up like it did, and, and Dawn's question: you know, how difficult it will be to reform it. 
Mm. Uh, the second question is, again, another correlate of that chart you showed is simply long-term interest rates mm. in the UK, which have been on a very long declining train over that mm -hmm. period, particularly since 2008. Again, uh, isn't that an obvious cause of what's happened? And isn't the most obvious way to solve this problem of high house prices to income to normalize monetary policy? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Josh, for the fascinating book and the fascinating talk. Uh, I've been looking, uh, as you know, at the specific case of uh, London's housing in particular. And uh, one thing that I've noted is that uh, right after the great financial uh, crisis, the recent one, uh, land prices uh, dropped significantly in London. But uh, house prices in this case didn't follow suit. They basically stagnated for a short while and kept increasing. Uh, how would you, from the top of your head, explain this recent disconnect, perhaps, between land prices and house prices? And uh, do you think that perhaps uh, uh, that gives a premonition of uh, what might be to come soon? Uh, what might arrive to house prices as well as land prices like this free flow. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, sorry, just on that last one, um, where, where have land prices fallen and house prices gone up? In, in London. Which parts of London? Well, uh, on aggregate. Right. On average. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I mean, house prices in London have also fallen in the last few years, right? rose slightly afterwards. Uh, well, most recently, they yeah. are uh, a bit falling, but they did not stop increasing after the, well, f maybe for a short while, but afterwards, they, uh, as far as the data that I have looked at, they mm. continue to grow, right. which is puzzling for me. Okay. I'm afraid I can't, I can't help you with that one, but maybe we can have a, a further discussion. Um, on the narrow banking question, uh, it's a good question. Um, I, uh, I mean, there is an argument which I, which I've made in my previous book, rethinking the economics of, of land and housing, that actually there, you know, you can kind of be a bit more fundamental about this problem of banks and housing, and land, and say, you know, actually, does it make any sense for banks which have very short-term liabilities, because you can withdraw your money from the bank whenever you want, basically. Um, to match those liabilities with extremely long-term assets, mortgages, essentially, um, because you're creating a maturity mismatch there that could be argued is fundamentally unstable. Um, so there is an argument to say that actually um, mortgage loans should be funded with equity, more equity-like um, types of, of finance, and that's the more Islamic finance um, type of, of model where the risk of the property value going up or falling down is shared by the lender and by the, the borrower. The thing with bank debt is the risk isn't shared, right? If, if, uh, if the house price falls and you can't, uh, or you lose your job and you can't pay back the mortgage, you know, the bank doesn't suffer, it just gets your house. Um, so it's a, it's a much less, in some senses, fair type of financial system. Um, so I'm um, not quite sure if I've addressed your, your question, but my suspicion would be in a narrow banking system where banks couldn't leverage up um, uh, a sovereign money system, um, they might take a much more conservative uh, approach to, to um, lending against uh, property. But it wouldn't necessarily stop some of the dynamics that I've talked about. I think you, need, you also need some form of credit guidance or institutions, banking institutions, where, that have a, a, a you know a, a directed to lend to the sectors we want them to lend to. Um, now we had a question about um, uh, increasing house price to income ratio and the baby boomer generation. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean about that um, trajectory. I mean I think I think this is this is the key challenge in a sense is. You know, we've got to get the, this baby boomer generation who've essentially been the luckiest people in the history of the world um, in terms of the, the wealth uh, uh, gains that they've enjoyed over the last um, sort of 30, 40 years uh, to kind of you know, wake up and say, you know, this, this just wasn't fair. Um, and as I said, the fact that their kids won't be able to buy a house 
I would hope, um, would, would help uh, with that. But we are facing a generational you know, crisis. Well, if they pass on, if they withdraw money or they downsize, not all of them want to do that, I can assure you. <laughs> Um, so there is a there is an issue there um, on interest rates. Uh, yeah, I think I think there is a pretty strong argument that um, you know falling interest rates have have fed into this process. Um, but I don't think that's as important as the deregulation of the banking system and this shift in what banks actually do and their incentive structure. This shift away from say relationship lending towards collateralized credit scoring type models. Um, and the, the, bank, you know, the central bank has the power, if it so wishes, to constrain the quantity of credit flowing into certain sectors as well as worrying about the price. Obviously, the problem if you raise interest rates, if you so normalize monetary policy, I don't know what you think normal is, but you know, if you raise interest rates to the historical norm, it'd be 5%, you'd have huge amounts of negative equity, you'd have an instant house price crisis collapse. Um, because so many people have got such huge levels of, of debt um, at the moment. So, so I wouldn't advise a, a sort of swift normalization of, of, monetary, um, of monetary policy. Uh, can you put your hands right up? Yep. Um, can I get the uh, woman in the white T-shirt and the black coat there, and then the lady in green with lovely long hair in the front of her? Sorry. Um, you made a number of criticisms of um, countries that are focusing on sort of building more homes. Uh, the government's sort of first flagship policy is sort of we have to build 300,000 homes a year by the mid 2020s. Are you saying that's the wrong target? And if so, what should their target be? Um, can we say our names as well? Apparently, Josh is about <laughs> uh, Daisy. Okay. Daisy Green, just there. Uh, you mentioned that, well, you argued that there needs to be a careful deflation of market and house values, and I just wondered how you would do that. Say that again, sorry. You argued for a, that a careful deflation of market and house values needs to take place, and I just wondered how you would do how? that. Right. And the gentleman just in front of you. Cheers. Hi, uh, my name is Maciek. Um, you touched upon the credit guidance as one mm. of the levers that can be used, so my question is, uh, whether effective credit, credit guidance is possible nowadays, given how big the financial sector became, the reg and political capture. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't quite catch the last part of that question. Um, so whether the, the, the effective credit, gu credit guidance by the central banks is possible nowadays, given right. how big the financial sector became, uh, okay. and yeah. the reg and political capture. Yeah. Shall I take those? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, on the building more homes, um, I do think we need more affordable homes built in this country. That is really important, particularly in the UK, probably more important than in some of those other Anglo-Saxon uh, economies, um, because essentially we've, um, we've just abandoned it. We've stopped building public housing. You know, it just stopped. And you need a mixed supply of housing, different types of, you know, you can have some private developers but you also need public housing. Um, and, and, and the important thing is that um, local authorities are able to return to the home building process um, and, and are not sort of forced to sell off their land um, because of austerity pressures. Um, and so they can actually see a sustainable business model um, there. So I would certainly not, not say um, uh, that we should abandon targets. Uh, I, think, I think just a target for more homes without specifying what types of homes and where they're going to be is problematic, right? Because we can build as many homes as we want in parts of the country where there's no jobs and it won't solve the problem because nobody will buy those homes. Uh, we need homes in areas where people can earn a decent wage. Um, and of course, those tend to be the areas where land prices are higher, uh, at where it makes it harder to build affordable housing. So. Uh, in that sense, it, the demand side dynamics, uh, the, the role of finance does play this important role. Um, careful deflation. Um, how would you do it? Well, you know, that's a really, that's a really tough question. Um, and I think hopefully most politicians are thinking hard about it. Um, I think, you know, what, what you've got to do is um, make sure that, the, that there's no danger of, of, of the sort of domino effect of 
uh, a small fall in, in house prices leading to everyone panicking, uh, not putting their home on the market anymore, um, uh, leading to, to, a, to, a faster, to a faster fall. Um, you know, Brexit might, uh, uh, you know, might lead to this kind of uh, effect. We've already seen in London, for example, people you know, not, choosing not to sell out of fear for the, for the future house prices. Um, you know, I think that's why you need this fiscal stimulus, this fiscal expansion at the time that you're, you're doing this, this, you're trying to achieve this deflation. And, and as I've already said, if you're introducing a property tax, make it at a low level, maybe reduce taxes elsewhere. Um, uh, uh, the other role potentially for the state could be to, um, you know, if somebody is in, is in trouble because of falling house prices, they're in negative equity, you know, the state could come in and essentially offer to, um, rather than being, you know, having to sell their house, um, the state could come in and again take some equity in the property, put a floor under under further falls by doing that, um, but allow the person to stay there and pay the the, the state or the local the local authority, um, you know, a small rent, for example. There are various different models that have been proposed for for ways in which you could try and prevent a sort of rapid um, a rapid fall in house prices. Uh, the credit guidance question. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you're right. You're right to you know question. I mean, I, I think it is challenging because uh, of the size of the financial sector, because of the globalization of, of finance. Um, you know, banks can find ways around national uh, regulation. So I do think capital controls might need to be introduced um, to support that. But again, I would. We're writing a paper on this at IIPP. Actually, I would. I would sort of re-emphasize the point that ultimately. Um, all banks have to settle uh, using central bank reserves, um, the central bank base money. Um, if the central bank doesn't let them have those reserves, they will become insolvent uh, and they will, uh, their business will collapse. So the central bank has this enormous power, actually, both formally and informally, to um, get banks to do what it wants them to do. They've chosen not to use that power uh, since the 1990s. Um, but there's plenty of historical evidence of effective uh, credit guidance. There's also evidence of less effective credit guidance and, and sort of, you know, uh, politicians getting captured by certain interests, sectoral interests. So it's got to be done carefully. But I think we should at very least be looking at it as a serious policy option. Um, can I uh, just in front of you there? Hi, I'm Hannah from Generation Rent, and um, I'm just thinking about the insecurity of private renting in this country, um, which of course makes private renting a tenure of last resort, because who wants to, say, have a family in a home where you've only got six months security? Um, but it also makes it attractive as a landlord's investment as well, because they have uh, absolute freedom over their asset. Um, so... But, of course, in Scotland, recently last year, they introduced open-ended tenancies and abolished no-fault evictions. Would you um, similarly here in England support an end to Section 21 no-fault evictions and um, introducing open-ended tenancies here? Can you put your hands right up because I'm staring into a dark auditorium. Um, can I get the woman in pink there and then the woman just in front of you there? You can just pass the mic after. Thank you. I'm afraid I'm another Hannah from Planning Futures. Um, I've got uh, two points um, or two questions that I wanted to ask. So firstly, talking about the calculation of uh, land tax, um, for example, what do you think would be the optimum percentage of tax on value now uh, to make a difference? Um, and what would you consider to get to, th to that percentage? Um, and the second point, uh, your comment on rent controls. Um, don't you just think that rent controls will alienate private landlords and therefore reduce renting options? Just the woman in front, no, just the woman in front of you, if you can pass the mic to her. Thanks. Uh, my name's Iona. Um, I have two um, hopefully quick questions. One, um, aren't building societies the same as the um, stakeholder banks you were talking about? Um, and secondly, is there a better way of describing us rather than Anglo-Saxon that maybe reflects <laughs> the, the diversity of our country? OK. Good. Um, Open-ended tendencies, uh, yes, absolutely. 
uh, that's as I said, that's what they have in in Germany. You know, it's very hard to uh, to get thrown out of your of your tenancy if uh, unless you do something you know really bad. Um, uh, fantastic that Scotland's you know leading the way here. Uh, also, they're doing some really interesting work on on um, on land value capture as, mm. as well. Um, so yes, uh, definite thumbs up on that on that one. We do need much stronger tenancy uh, security. Um, Land tax optimum percentage on value, um, not sure, haven't given it enough depth, in-depth thoughts, to be honest, to give you a, an honest answer there. Um, you know, I think what, what's important is that we move towards a system where the full increase in the value in, say, one year, uh, in the, the land value, you know, if you, if you put in a new kitchen, you shouldn't be taxed on increasing the value of your property because you've invested in something. You've, again, you've employed people to put in that kitchen. You've contributed to the economy. But if you do nothing and, you know, the local, uh, that there's a new railway or a new road or a new school that opens up, you know, why should you uh, uh, just enjoy that uh, increase in value from land? That, sh that should be taxed. So we want to be moving towards taxing that increment, incremental increase. Um, rent controls... I think I kind of answered that question already, actually, when, when I talked about you, know, you need to get institutional investors coming in if you're going to, as you say, alienate private landlords. You do need a new source of... of do, you, I mean, um, do you buy the argument that landlords, if, if they have their, their rental yield reduced a little bit, will just withdraw entirely from the market? Yeah, I think that's a genuine financial risk, yeah. Um, and I know the Bank of England's you know, looking at it quite, quite, quite seriously. Um, uh, so I think it would just need to be done, managed carefully, but it does need to be done. Um, building societies, um, yeah. Building societies, um, as I was saying, uh, mortgage lending used to only be done by mutuals, basically. And building societies, like the stakeholder banks I talked about, are owned by their members. So their members have a stake in uh, making sure they don't do any silly lending, but do sensible lending. Um, so um, they are a much better model for mortgage lending. Historically, they haven't done business lending. They haven't lent to, to businesses. So they don't solve the sort of SME finance gap that we've got in this country and, other, and other, uh, some of the other countries. They don't solve the, the, the fall in, uh, relative fall in lending to, uh, to firms that we've, we've experienced. Um, but obviously, you know, we've got nationwide... Um, one of the biggest banks in the country. They've shown it's possible to have, be a big, successful building society. They didn't really run into major difficulty during the financial crisis. Again, I guess that's evidence that the building society model is, is, a, is a better model. And um, what about the Anglo-Saxon question? <laughs> Sorry, yes. Can, what was the question? Can we think of a better name than, than just Anglo-Saxon? Um, countries um, afflicted with the disease called residential capitalism. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful, but that's what it is. You know, it's residential capitalism in the sense that our whole economies have become addicted to ever increasing uh, house prices in order to sort of keep them chugging along, basically. Uh, brilliant. I'm sure there are more questions, but we're very, very short on time now. But we will be moving uh, to a room just over the hall for drinks. So do join us. Do keep talking. I'm sure we'll answer some, any other questions you have. And Joshy's book is available for sale for the bargain price of 9 99 just outside. Um, so I'd like to thank Josh for this great talk and all of you for coming and having such great questions. <laughs>